Hi, my name is Leslie L. Harrington, and I'm here with Nashala Joy Davy. And I am so excited and so proud to have her and be able to have a great conversation with her. I'd like to share just a little bit of background about her. She is a masterful teacher, a healer and yoga expert who has been teaching for more than 30 years. And her teachings allow to expand beyond the boundaries and limitations of any one tradition, enabling her to touch people's hearts. Her most recent and third book that she has is called The Namaste Effect, expressing universal love through the chakras. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today, oh, Nishla. It's a joy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I think um, it would be so important to start talking about a little bit about how you came to the journey of yoga and kind of what does yoga mean to you? Well, you know, it's a, it's a great question because I think people nowadays, they don't really understand how we go. A lot of people will go to yoga classes for their back that hurt or for something else or some other reason. And I don't think that's the way I came because in when I started with yoga, it wasn't just a physical practice. It was a total spiritual practice. You have to remember all the masters were just coming over and they were sharing all their wonderful depth of yoga. And asana was a tiny little part, just a tiny little part. And I, I was originally trained in medicine. Uh, and so I was working in Western medicine and feeling very depleted, very much, what am I doing? Why are people there? Why are people not understanding what their body is about, what their, their whole spirit is about? So I, I was very disillusioned and um, was looking for something else to bring meaning into my life. And I knew there was more because I was work, working with people's bodies but I could see there was something inside the body that they forgot to work with. So I just immediately cleaved to this amazing set of practices and philosophy and wisdom. And before I knew it, I was deeply involved in yoga. When we think of the word yoga, it means literally to unite or to yoke. And when we talk about that with in the yogi world, and even with everybody else, it's like, how do we explain that? What, how do you, what's your definition of it? It means to bring together to yog, 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 actually is the word. And I think what we forget sometimes in our world is we pay attention sometimes to the body, and now the body is getting a little bit more press, which is good. And we understand that we have mind, but we think of them separately. We think of the body is here and the mind is there, and we forget about the spirit completely, completely. So what the idea is, and what I keep saying to people is, body is just gross mind. So what you're thinking actually is how your body will appear, and your mind is subtle body. So when you work it like that, you can realize that everything that we do and say has an effect on our bodies, has an effect on our minds. And, you know, there's a beautiful quote that I like to use from Coco Chanel. She was a great, she was an amazing woman and an amazing fashion designer because she actually brought femininity back into clothes, especially for the work people. And she said something very beautiful. She said, the beauty that she was talking about women because that's who she worked with. And she said, the beauty that a woman has before the age of 30 is genetic and she enjoys that. But the beauty she has after the age of 30 is what she has done with her life. And wow. I thought it was so profound because that's it. When you look at someone, you're not just looking at, at flesh, you're looking at how they live their life. Are they joyous? I think the best thing we can have are laugh lines because that shows that we laugh a lot. And I don't think people laugh quite enough and they don't seem to have the joy and they don't express the joy in their face or on their body. They're slumped over, they're feeling not alive and not vital. And I think this is a big problem nowadays. So yoga seems to take in the body, the mind, emotions, and the spirit and yoga them together, bring them back together. So when I look at you, I'm not looking at a body, I'm not looking at a mind but I'm looking at the totality 
of your spirit. I think that was perfect to, to unite the unite and really the mind, the body and the heart or the spirit as you talk about. It. And I think that's what we're missing in so much. We do the physical asana practice, the, the poses of yoga and people work out and we're missing so much more. But the, you're right, the element of yoga and why people love, like they come to yoga class and they're like, there's something else. And we talk about the mind, you know, and then we talk about how that all comes together. And when we live more in our heart, and um, I think the Sioux legend says something about the longest journey will in our life will be from our head to our heart. And I just found that one. And I love that. So that kind of relates to, um, I, like in, in your book, The Secret Power of Yoga, I use this in a lot of my teacher trainings because it speaks so eloquently to, um, you know, just the ideas about what we're all looking for and how to kind of get there. In First Sutra, Atta Yoga Nushasana now is, is yoga. What, what does that mean to you? It's so funny to me because it's the very first sutra and it's supposed to set the tone for the whole book. But people just read it and say, oh, now awesome. Now the teaching of yoga is about to begin and we just go on. But why would that be there? That's the question. Why would they even bother saying now is the teaching of yoga? Does it make sense? It's just taking up space. But what does it really mean? So having been trained by quite a few masters, of Indian masters in yoga, I realized that the main thing that we have to come to as students is humility. If there's no humility, then we have no way of learning. If you come to a teacher and say, okay, I know everything, then there's nothing for them to teach you. But if you come like this, please teach me with open hands. It's a very different experience. So this to me sets the tone that what we are about to encounter are these incredibly sacred teachings from thousands and thousands of years ago that have been passed down orally mostly from student, from teacher to student, and then student becomes the teacher and goes on. If we can't have a certain amount of humility. Now I know humility is not a big word in the United States. We're not big on humility. We like being- You're right. <laughs> we, we want to be the ones. But in order to learn these sacred teachings, there has to be a way of, of them being offered so we can understand who we are. And humility, that's why I, how I define it is with humility and open heart and mind, we embrace the sacred study of yoga. Because without it, it doesn't make sense. It's not just now at the exposition of yoga is about to begin or whatever it is. There's a reason. And teachers made you work hard to, to find that humility. The, uh, the Zen adage that before enlightenment, you chop wood, carry water. And after enlightenment, you chop wood and carry wood. There's really no difference. But to come to a teacher who has this incredible wisdom and not to be humble in front of them doesn't make sense to me. So this is, and then all the stories that were told, you know, where did you leave your umbrella? Where did you leave your shoes? If you don't know where your shoes are, you can't learn the great teachings of yoga. So everything is all combined with it. And that's why this, that sutra takes so much time when I'm teaching it because it sets the tone for the whole book. And if you say, well, I already know the sutras, well then what's the point to learning it? So the humility has to be there and the heart has to be there. Otherwise it's just an intellectual gyration and nothing really allows it to continue. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a great explanation of it. Thank you, I love to hear that. I always think of like, you know, as a yoga teacher, we always say, come to your yoga mat with it's the first time you've been to yoga it's with a fresh mind yes. you know and so that's kind of, it's it really is um the first sutra the first line in the yoga sutras and the thread which threads it all together so so beautifully so um yeah i, I can see why you would spend a lot of time on that one in particular for sure so is there another no, go ahead i was just going to say they just don't understand the idea that you humble yourself in front of a teacher if you want to learn from them. It's not for the teacher's sake that you're becoming humble. It's for your sake that you're becoming humble. 
got to wring out a sponge. If the sun, a sponge is already soaked up, you can't get any more knowledge, right? So kind of come with empty an empty bucket. So I always like to think of it also as, um, and I don't know if this is accurate, but it's just my take on it is now as exhibition of yoga. Okay, now, guess what? And we can start again. And we yeah. can start again. And else be present with it each time so that now we can keep doing this. So let go of what happened a moment ago and we can start again. Great so. interpretation. Right and forgiveness it too. No, <laughs> no we, I, I really love, I love what you've done with it too. So, um, you know, when, when a lot of my students, they, they, I'll, I'll read a couple of other translations and then I'll pick up your book and I'll do the translation right next to it. And even, um, when we talk about like different words, like maybe another translation will have a word that says ignorance and you chose the word to say innocence instead. And I just see my students' hearts open up to that and that just seems so freeing you know about the about those specific words it's so funny how they can kind of mean the same thing but we have our own lens around it already why did you choose that word innocence and and some of the other words in it differently than i've seen translated before well I, you know very astute that you picked that up because you know it's it was really hard for me a lot of the sutra books have been translated by scholars. Most, uh, most of the teachers, the spiritual teachers, didn't have that kind of skill. You know, it's a separate, it's a different part of the brain to translate Sanskrit into English as, as opposed to experiencing the truths in it. It's a very different way. So one of the things that I've done is I made sure I took out all the, as many of the negatives as I can, all the nons, I don't want to be told what not to do. I want to be told what to do. Don't tell me don't kill. Don't tell me don't harm. Tell me to love people. It's, a ver it's the same. It's just the opposite. So with this particular situation with ignorance and innocence, personally, I wouldn't like it if somebody called me ignorant. Because ignorant is very different. It's, first of all, it has the word ignore in it. So to ignore something is a conscious thing. So for instance, if, if you walked in the room and I'm talking to someone and I didn't want to see you, and I would say to that person, don't look, don't talk, just keep talking to me because I don't want to see her, right? And that's how it would go. And then what happens is you're creating this, this whole situation that doesn't really need to be there. How much energy does it take to ignore somebody, right? You're, they're oh, there. Right. And they say, is she gone? Did she pass? Is she finished? What's happening with this? And before you know it, you're spending so much time ignoring somebody. Instead, you could be loving them instead, and it would be much better. So what I, I, when I started to really look at this, I realized that we're not bad people. We just don't know. And if you don't know some, something, you're innocent of it. Like you can't say to a small baby, stop pooping in your diaper because <laughs> that's not how it should be. You know that they're, they're babies and they'll grow up and won't need diapers anymore. So you wouldn't call them ignorant though. You would say they're innocent of it. And I feel that most people are innocent of their true nature. They're not, they're not ignoring it. They just don't even know it's there. So I, I'd rather go back to the positive word. Why frame something in a negative way if you can frame it positively? That, that's at least how I think of it. So that's why I chose to use the word innocent of our true nature rather than ig ignorant of it. Don't you think? I mean, if I said to you, you're ignorant, you'd probably walk out of the room and say to me, I want to be with you. But if I said, you're just innocent. You just don't even know it's there. It's a very different meaning, at least to me. And I think also a lot of people who translated these didn't have full command of the English language. I'm sorry to say that. And all of them are, were also men. And I think women are more um, uh, what would, generous in their uh, ability to compliment and their ability to give love in that way. Not that men can't. But I think women have a generosity of spirit because they raise the children and they want to compliment the children. So anyway, that's, that's why I chose that word. And, and the other ones, like ahimsa. 
Ahimsa is not nonviolence. It's having love and, and, and compassion for everyone. It's very different. You start saying it's nonviolent. Well, that means I'm a violent person and I'm trying not to be violent. No, that's not what it is. It's having love and compassion for people. Don't you think? Oh, oh it feels so nice. Honestly, I feel like I've, I grew up in different um, forms of traditional religion and you get told this is not what you're supposed to do. You shouldn't be doing that. Or like even looking at a broader scope, like the golf game or sports, they don't say, don't hit the sand trap. They say, look down the fairway. Cause you know, if you don't look at the sand trap, you're going to hit the sand trap. So it, it's like, it is the positive. It's like, here's what to focus on. Where is our gaze? Where's our dirty? Where are we looking? Where are we focusing? And how are we taking it forward? And I feel like that's why so many people resonate with your version like of the sutras because it has that beautiful vision ahead for us, which is really wonderful. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the reasons I wrote it because I was teaching it and people said, there's nothing like this. Everything is always negative or don't do this or don't do that. And so I said, okay, I'll sit down and see if I can put this into on paper. And fortunately it came. So it's, it's, I think it's, I think it's time that we update everything because our consciousness has changed. Women are now doing in spirituality more than men even. And we have a different way of looking at things. Like there's a sutra that talks about disgust for one's body. And I think that's a horrible thing to say. And a woman wouldn't say that. You don't shame a child for spoiling their pants. You just change them and you, you work with that. So I think there's a lot of things that have to be updated now that women have moved into spirituality in this way. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's great. That actually answers one of my questions I was going to ask about why you um, chose to write these books. Like what was your path to writing? You have three books and many CDs, many courses. How, how is it that you came to these along the way? How was your journey to like, was it a calling? Was it like, I see something like you said about the sutras. It's like, oh, it needed to be happened. So you did it. Uh, it was all of that. It was a calling. I don't think you can do this work as long as I have, and it, with the intensity that I have, if it's not a calling, because it has to be. But also seeing the need for, I really, my prim, primary is a speaker, I'm secondary a writer. And it's not, it's not as easy for me because I love to speak to people, I get energy and I give energy, it's a, a continuum. Whereas a book, it's a little bit different. You write it, you put it out there and you hope for the best. Um, but I saw the need, especially in the sutras. I mean, even in the first book, The Healing Path of Yoga, when I wrote that, there was no yoga, th there were no yoga therapy books out. And I had done it based on our research and it was time for people to know what we did. And then the sutra book, it was the same kind of thing. There was nothing out there. There was no book that I felt totally comfortable using in my sutra class. I always had to change it. And I said, this is ridiculous. At least one woman should write a book from a woman's perspective, since 99% of the people now are women who come to yoga classes. But I didn't write it with the exclusion of men. I hopefully it, they're included in it. Matter of fact, even in the dedication, men are included. But there had to be some way to explain to women what these sutras were without excluding them. And the women have been exclu excluded in spirituality way, way too long. And I thought it would open the floodgates, to tell you the truth. I thought all these women would start writing books in the sutras, and that's not what happened. So that was a little disappointing. I wasn't making mine exclusive. I was hoping that other people would join in with it. And then with the Namaste effect, it was more available to people. I felt like some of the books were just so difficult to understand. And I think we learn through stories. And I think that's, so that's one of the things I added the stories to it to describe how a chakra could look when it's balanced or how it could look when it's not balanced. And so, so each of the books had a very specific reason for it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So what brought you overall to the Namaste effect? And can you talk to me just a little bit about it? I've been reading it and really enjoying it. Tell us first, what is a chakra? 
A chakra is a uh, energy center, and we have seven major chakras. People always want to talk about the minor ones, but really it's the major ones that we look at. And they're along the spine, and they hold all the information that we could ever want and need and more. So it holds how we should act, how we should live, how, um, our reference to the spiritual world. Who are we in relation to that? What's our relationship to the earth? And also how to work with other people, how to, how to relate to people, not as human beings only, but as spiritual beings. And I, you know, I wrote this and uh, because my heart is breaking to tell you the truth, what's going on in this world right now. And my feeling is if we don't start loving each other and now we're just, we're gonna blow up this planet. This planet isn't gonna be habitable anymore. And I, so I felt frustrated. I didn't know anything else I could do as an ordinary citizen. I'm not in Congress, I'm not the president. I can't do anything in big ways, but I can put out the message of love. And that's why I wrote the book at this particular time. It was just, it, I hoped it would counter a little bit of the hatred a little bit of the, uh, the bullying, a little bit of the uh, discrimination, a little bit of the racism and sexism and everything that's going on right now. Would somebody pick this up and maybe just spark that love in their hearts to be more kind to the person sitting next to them, more kind to the person that is handing them their change from across the counter realizing that this is a human being that wants to be loved just like anybody else. So the term namaste means when I am in the place of oneness and you are in the place of oneness, we are one. So that to me is if we could keep doing that to everyone around the world, how different would it be? If I saw you and I said, wait a minute, she's not black or white, male or female, United States or Arab or wherever, Africa, she and I are the same. Our hearts beat in the same way. She has the spirit in her just like I have the spirit in me. The world would be different. And that's what I experience when I travel. I don't care their language. I don't care their color. Who are they? They're the divine spirit. And that's, so that's what the namaste effect is about. And that's why I call it the namaste effect. Can we make this contagious? Can we go around and just love everyone for no apparent reason at all, except that we and they are all divine? Seems simple. We'll see how it works. <sighs> <laughs> well, it'd be simpler. I think if you're right, like if Gandhi says, be the change you want to see in the world. So first of all, we all have to love ourselves and give ourselves kind of this grace and this ease. And um, I love that in both of your books that I've read, so both of these books, they both have um, things to do. So it's not just, here's the, here's the ideas, but you give us things to do. So tell us a little bit about that. I felt that to me, the best way to learn is to bring it into your own life, to make it really visceral. How do you feel about this? How do you feel when you do something like this? How do you feel when you say something unkind to somebody? Where do you feel it? And where do you feel something when you say something kind to someone? So it's really a consciousness awareness. And to me, without the practices, there is no yoga. Yoga brings, yoga is practices. And what it does, it allows us to incorporate on a visceral level again, on a feeling level, on a tactile level, what these teachings mean. So to me, it's one of the most important things to add to it. And um, I, don't th I think most texts, most books are not like that. And that's a problem because we really want to learn it that every cell in our body, it's like anything else, you know, even something unpleasant. As a young child, we probably learned, don't put your hand there because it's gonna be hot. And after a while, you're not thinking it anymore, but when you start to put your hand near something hot, you pull it away very quickly. And to me, that kind of, of consciousness 
that's in every cell in our finger has to permeate everything we do. So when the choice comes and you see someone who's different than you are, or perhaps they have a different idea than you are, instead of having a knee jerk reaction, I don't like that person. Instead, you pull back and you say, wait a minute, the same heart beats in both of us. The same consciousness lives in both of us. My first line of action is going to be to love them, not to, not to hate them, not to be prejudiced against them. And I think that changes everything. It changes everything. You know, I spent some time, uh, I don't know if you, you read it in the books yet, but I put the stories in, a, in the Soviet Union while it was still the Soviet Union and communist was very much prevalent at the time. And we went over to try to give them a little bit of this understanding, etc. And what I found is that these people who had been talked about as our enemies for so many years, as children, we were frightened by the talk of it, that suddenly when I looked in their eyes, they were just like me. They weren't any different. They wanted exactly the same thing. They wanted their children to be safe and healthy and protected. They wanted to live in peace. They wanted to have their family safe. It was exactly the same. And it was such an amazing experience for me um, that I, when I went back the second time, they were my family. And that's how they treated me. I, I actually gave a keynote at the first ever yoga conference in Moscow. Wow. And oh, it was an amazing experience. And what I did is I talked about love. And afterwards, I could barely get off the stage. They all came up because I talked about love. They wanted to love me. And I wanted to love them. So we started hugging and kissing and taking. It was just an amazing love fest because I was no longer the other. I was no longer this enemy from the United States. I was them and they were me. So that's, that's really where we have to go. And, you know, I, I always think of Margaret Mead and her beautiful quote that talked about never doubt that a small group of, I'm going to, it makes me tear up every time. Aww. Never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it has never been any other way. It's just you, me, doing it. Loving one person, loving 20 people, and then they pass it on to the other people. And that's, that's to me real spirituality, not just sitting in a temple or a church or a synagogue or a mosque or wherever you're going to sit and listening, but really actualizing it, going out and loving people. And that's to me what it's all about. And that's what yoga is. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. That's amazing. That story is so great. I love it. Yeah. Uh, that connection. I think, you know, they say, you know, when, uh, when people come into depression, that it's because we're disconnected. So we're, you know, not connected. So what's the best thing to get out of it is to go help somebody else to go do something else for somebody else. And then you get out of it and they say like the happiest cultures in the world are the ones that have community all the time. And we forget that and we get this disconnected because we're working on this, we're working on that, having to do different things. So how do we, I think we're like what you're saying, we're at a precipice. The world is at a precipice. But if we can actually make a huge significant change with our hearts, when we make connection and let go of the ego a little bit, well, ego's good too. We need it for action, but like let go of it just a little bit and see like, okay, how can we help somebody else? How can we do that? be a little vulnerable. I think that's why Brene Brown is so big right now in the corporate world with vulnerability. Okay, let's bring that out. You know what? We're all striving for the same thing. Like you said, whether it's looking into the eyes of the kids in, in Russia or they all want just family and heart. And so if we live a little more heart centered, like you're talking about, I think that'll help a lot. Even a little bit, as you're saying, would make a tremendous difference. We don't, ha we don't have to walk around like this all the time. <laughs> yeah. But I always tell people, people say to me, I'm afraid to walk around with my heart open that it's going to get hurt. And I said, it's not worth keeping it closed just to protect it. It will take care of itself. And we have, if we don't do that, we see what's happening in the world. It's scary what's happening right now with people not loving each other. 
And I would say, so this is my thing about men and women. Men have been in charge of the world for probably more than 5,000 years now. Give women 5,000 years. Let's see if we, how we do with it. If we don't do a good job after 5,000 years, we'll figure out something else. But I think it's time that women and women's ways of loving are seen more in the world. Otherwise, we're, we're really heading down a really scary path as far as I'm concerned. The intellect will only take you so far. You have to be open-hearted and loving. You can keep the intellect. And like you said about the ego, yes, we need the ego, but it should be more purified. It shouldn't be just, what it's, it's all about me. No, it's not all about you. It's all about us. And we're all linked together. We're like trees. If you look at a tree, it looks like they're independent. But if you go a little bit under the surface, all the roots are entwined. And we can't be independent. We're interdependent on each other, all of us. So we might as well love each other. That's how I see it anyway. I love it. That's awesome. I love that. Would there be one good, maybe sutra or one good lesson or one thing that you'd like to communicate that would help somebody that's trying to be healthier and happier? I can give you one from each book or one oh, from yeah. two books. So let's talk about the namaste first. So the namaste effect, what I would say is make it your work, your life's work not your professional work, but your life's work to share kindness with one person a day, at least, that you haven't already shared it with. And it could be a stranger, it could be someone you work with, it could be the postman or the post person, I guess it is now, first person, <laughs> mail, letter carrier, um, anybody <laughs> who hands you the UPS package. And do you really take the time to thank them and look at, look at them and, and be honor that they have been riding around in this truck all day long. So I think that promise day effect, that's really one of the main things I would say. Take time every day to find a new person to share that with. I think that'll change your life. That's how I feel. And you know, you sit down next to someone, just greet them. Good morning. That's all we have to do. It doesn't have to be a big conversation. Just good morning. And if you pass someone on the street and they're asking you for help and you don't feel like you want to give money, at least give kindness. Just be kind to them. Don't be rude and say, get a job or why can't you do this? Just kind. It's so simple to be kind. And yet we forget it. Uh, matter of fact, I just bought a t-shirt. It was on sale, which is a sweatshirt, which was on sale. And I wondered why it was on sale so much. It was reduced down to like $12 at one of the department stores. And it says on it, cultivate kindness. Right along the neck. And I thought to myself, you know, that's the message. Cultivate kindness. And I bought it just because it said that, you know. And so I think that's the main thing from one of the things from the namaste effect. From the sutras, one of my favorite sutras is, um, it's actually number 33 in the second book. And it's Pratipaksha Bhavana. And it says, when, when plagued with disturbing thoughts or feelings, cultivate the opposite. And I think this to me is something I use every day when someone says something unkind or does something unkind or I'm put on hold on the, in the phone. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> took a deep breath with that one, right? It's, yes. <laughs> you know, and I spend a lot of time making um, travel arrangements and sometimes I'm on the phone for hours and they keep putting me on hold and I get annoyed and then I stop and I think to myself, wait a minute, this is not an easy job they have dealing with people who want certain things but can't get them, et cetera. So I try to be extra nice and I just switch. If I'm annoyed, I say, okay, what can I do? I can be more loving. So that's the, the Padipaksha Bhavana. And it's an interesting term. Bhavana comes, it actually our main verb in English comes from the Sanskrit word Bhavana, which is to be. 
So our verb to be comes from bhavana. So bhavana is a way of being. It's an attitude of being. Can we change our attitude? It's a little bit like the cultivating kindness, but it's whatever it is. So say someone comes in and they say to me, your ticket is no longer good. You're going to lose your thousand dollars that you just paid for. Well, I'm going to get angry, maybe. But is that the appropriate response for this particular person? Is it his fault? Is it her fault? No. Do they really want to hear it? No. So this is the kind of thing that you can just switch. Do I have time for a little story? Yeah, 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 for okay. sure. So this was actually something that really happened. I had called the airline. I was trying to get something. I can't even remember what I was trying to get. Changed. And I called up. It was an international ticket, and they're never very easy to change that. So this man came, so it was about quarter to five when I called, a little before five. And I called up and he didn't exactly know what he was doing, so he keep, kept putting me on hold, etc. So I decided that I didn't want to be mean to him because this is not what this man needed. So I kept a little pad of paper beside my uh, the phone with a pencil and I started to write Om Shanti, which means peace. And as he was putting me on hold, I'm writing Om Shanti, Om Shanti, and I'm starting to feel very calm and peaceful. So every time he comes back and he says something, he said, and I have to put you on hold again for a few minutes, is that okay? And I go, okay. So he puts me on and I'm writing. And then finally he came back, he had gotten everything settled and I don't know how long it took, it took, seemed to take a long time. And I said to him, thank you very much. And all I wanted to do was get off the phone. <laughs> And he said to me, no, no, I want to thank you. And I said, you want to thank me? He said, people have been yelling at me all day long. And I do my job as best as I can. I know I'm not fast, but I try to be diligent. He said, and then they just kept yelling at me and I decided I was going to quit. I didn't want to take this abuse. But I wanted to fulfill my, my position till five o'clock. And then you called right before five and I thought, okay, I'll take one more call and then I'll hand in my resignation. And it was oh, you. Wow. And he said, you were so patient with me. You were so kind that I decided I'm going to give this job another chance. And I've made a decision that I am going to be as kind and yes, even loving as you were to the next person that calls because that's the kind of person I want to be. And I just pray that I someday have your patience and love for everybody. I was stunned. And I looked down at my little pad of paper that I had written this mantra, Om Shanti. And I thought, see, if you change your thought, your heart changes too. So that's the Pradipaksha Bhavana lesson that I learned. And I've put it in the book. And you know what? So many people say, I read that and I'm going to be kind to the next person that I talk to on the telephone or in the store or wherever it is. These are the little things that we can do every day that what I call it spiritualizes our life. We have the choice. So you can say, oh, I'm merely human and take on the, all the human characteristics especially the negative ones. Usually when people say that, what they're saying is, well, I can make these mistakes because I'm human. But I always say to them, you're human, but you're also divine. Why not combine the two? That's why. That's, I really that's amazing. I love it. That's, that's so true. I mean, you felt better getting off of the phone call than being mad. <laughs> He felt way better. <laughs> you, all you need, let him, you know, would change his whole life and his decision about his job. That's beautiful. You know, I talk to my clients about like, you're going to reduce your stress. You're going to reduce your blood pressure. You're going to feel better. You're going to be happier if you're not putting stress on yourself like that with your thoughts. Absolutely. And you just, that's a beautiful story. And that's how people learn is through these stories. And that's why I really appreciate the Namaste effect because you have stories. Stories are the way that we all learn these lessons. 
So thank you so much for writing these books and thank you so much for taking your time to be here today to talk with me. It's been a, a true blessing to be able to teach out of this book. It's been a gift for myself, even though I give it to my students, I learn so much every single time. And I look forward to now including the Namaste effect in my teaching. So thank you so much. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. So you have some trainings coming up and some events. Don't you have some yes. events? How can we find you? Uh, my website is abundant well being because that's what everyone wants an abundance of well being. So abundant well being.com and they can find out about the books and the events that I have. I'm usually many places in the world. So you can find me somewhere and uh, I would love to see everybody because I can't see you, but you can see me. So it would be fun if you uh, come in. Also, I'm on Facebook, this Chilla Joy Davy, Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> so I've, oh, joined, wonderful. I've joined the 21st century. Yes. So well, I will put um, all your information in the comments below so people have the links. They'll be able to find you to get your books and um, to also uh, attend your events and your teachings because um, they're wonderful. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, if you liked some of that content, make sure that you like, subscribe, and share with your friends so that we can know that you like the content and we'll make more. Thanks so much, everybody.